let's um, let's go uh, and introduce our second speaker for today. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Annie Nigra. She's a, a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University, Department of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Nigra uh, completed her uh, undergraduate in biology at Oberlin College, her uh, Master of Sciences at Johns Hopkins University in epidemiology, and then her PhD in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University, where she's been a trainee uh, from the, uh, in the Superfund Research Program of Columbia University since she joined the PhD program. And today she's going to be sharing some of the work that she started during her PhD and that she has actually been expanding quite a bit related to arsenic uh, monitoring in community water systems in, in the US, uh, kind of curating really important databases that have been underutilized, I would say both for the purpose of uh, monitoring arsenic around the US and in particularly for connecting it to epidemiology and to other uh, usages that this data could have. So th those are really important databases that Annie has done a tremendous effort in making them really usable. And then she's also going to start working on her more recent work with uranium and some other uh, water contaminants. And, and also how she's been now mentoring uh, students doing uh, additional work with these databases and, and highlighting very important inequalities that we currently have uh, in the exposure to contaminants to community water systems. So thank you, Annie, uh, so much. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. The screen is yours. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. Can you see the, the uh, full screen here? I do this? Not yet the full screen. Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Um, so thanks, Anna. Um, I'm Annie. I have my, uh, my email and my uh, little Twitter handle here. Um, feel free to um, reach out uh, before or after. I'd love to be in <laughs> touch with um, any of you. Okay, so to, uh, the title of this talk is Inequalities in Public Water Arsenic and Uranium Levels in Counties and Community Water Systems Across the U.S. So I wanted to start with a very brief uh, primer on drinking water infrastructure in the U.S. Um, so the majority of residents of the U.S. rely on either a public water system or a private uh, slash domestic well for their drinking water if they have water that's piped into their homes. Uh, private wells over here on the right uh, serve about 45 million Americans, and they're not regulated uh, by states or by EPA. Um, and this is certainly a concern for many contaminants, including arsenic. Um, but the work that uh, I'm going to focus on today is for public water systems. Uh, these serve over almost 85% of the U.S. population. They serve the same population year round. They are regulated by EPA through the purview of the Safe Drinking Water Act um, and are also regulated by states. Um, as Mindy said earlier, um, states have the ability to set more strict and health protective regulatory standards than uh, what EPA sets. There are over 80 federally regulated contaminants in public drinking water systems. And EPA sets either uh, treatment techniques or MCLs, maximum contaminant levels, for those contaminants. Uh, it, and a result of that is that public water systems are required to conduct uh, routine compliance monitoring. One type of public water system, which we're gonna focus on today, are community water systems. And these are public water systems that serve um, at least 25 people or 15 connections year round. These are the major public water systems, such as New York City's public water system, um, that most of us drink from all the time. So the contaminants that EPA regulates fall into one of these five classes. We have microbials, we have disinfection byproducts, organics, inorganics, including metals, and radionuclides. And today I'm just focusing on arsenic and uranium here. Um, the, this project really spiraled out because I, at the time, a few years ago, 
wanted to assign NHANES participants, NHANES is a large cross-sectional study of the US population, and I wanted to assign those participants um, a value for uh, arsenic exposure from public drinking water systems, so I could do some epidemiological analyses, and I found that those estimates did not exist in the US. So we have national monitoring networks for air pollution, uh, but we don't have something similar for drinking water contaminants for public water systems. So uh, I found this to be a, a gap and a real need, uh, a gap that needed to be filled here. These are also two contaminants um, that we know disproportionately impact um, indigenous uh, communities in the US. And they're also both contaminants um, for which uh, EPA has set a maximum contaminant goal level of zero micrograms per liter uh, because of uh, cancer health outcome concerns. And just a note here that um, although that maximum contaminant level goal is zero, um, both of these contaminants um, also have uh, chemical toxicity. So for inorganic arsenic, even at low to moderate levels of exposure, uh, we know there are associations with uh, various types of cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. And for uranium, we know that the kidneys are the primary uh, target organ. So uh, EPA set two major um, regulatory rules uh, in the past 20 years uh, regarding arsenic and uranium in public water systems. The first is the final arsenic rule, which was uh, became enforceable in 2006. And the second is the radionuclides rule, uh, which became enforceable in 2003. So for arsenic prior to 2001, the MCL was 50 micrograms per liter. And for uranium prior to 2000, there was no MCL at all, so uranium was, was not regulated. After these rules were established, um, the MCL for arsenic went into effect in 2006. That MCL is 10 micrograms per liter. And for uranium, this MCL of 30 micrograms per liter went into effect in 2003. Um, ways that water systems could come into compliance with these new, more health protective MCLs would be switching or mixing source water or installing uh, treatment systems. In this slide, I'm just gonna briefly introduce EPA's standard monitoring framework. And I'm gonna give the example here for uranium. So this is a framework that describes how often, how, how frequently uh, public water systems have to test for various contaminants in their drinking water. And uh, this framework for uranium is complicated by the fact that this was a new MCL and uranium had not been uh, regulated before. And so water systems were not uh, monitoring for uranium regularly. So there are three kind of main time periods here that I've outlined. Um, there was a period where water systems could voluntarily collect uranium data that could be grandfathered in. There's a time period where water systems were required to collect monitoring data. And then finally, we move into the first uh, compliance cycle. So the concentrations of uranium that were measured during the voluntary and required monitoring cycles are the concentrations that determine the compliance monitoring schedule for those water systems. So depending on whether that water system utilizes ground or surface water as the main source water type, and depending on whether the uranium concentrations fell into one of these four buckets, above or below the MCL or below the detection limit, water systems um, are then required to conduct monitoring uh, everywhere from quarterly up to once every nine years. And so the point of this slide is just to illustrate that the number of compliance records that each community water system is required to uh, sample and required to report differs greatly. We do know quite a bit about arsenic occurrence uh, in private well water in the US, um, thanks to Joe Iop, who's, who's here on this call, um, so, and, and his USGS colleagues. Uh, so this map on the left is a map of the probability of arsenic exceeding 10 micrograms per liter in private wells throughout the US um, that, they've, that they've modeled. Uh, so we know, for example, that private well arsenic is quite high in the Southwestern US, in um, several parts of what I would call the Midwest and certainly up here in Maine and in parts of New England. Um, but what we're trying to fill in today is this map over here for public water system arsenic. 
for uranium, um, to the best of my ability, I haven't been able to find a nationwide map of estimated uranium in private wells or in groundwater. So if anyone has that, um, that would be wonderful. I would love to see it. Um, I've seen individual states that USGS has modeled, um, which is quite interesting, including Connecticut, um, Washington. But here I've just outlined um, or borrowed this, this map from USGS identifying some major uranium deposits that might give us a hint of where we might expect public water uh, uranium to also be high. But I'm going to start by just presenting our work on arsenic um, and then in the second section I'll present um, the findings for uranium. So we had three major objectives for this work. The first was merely to generate national estimates of public drinking water arsenic exposure uh, at the level of the community water system and the county, uh, as Anna said, to both enable surveillance and also epidemiologic research. And as a reminder, these are public systems that serve the same populations year round. The second objective was to evaluate trends in public water arsenic concentrations in the US over time at the level of the water system in the county. And this is relevant for arsenic because there was a previous MCL, 50 micrograms per liter, um, that was um, changed and, and now it's 10 micrograms per liter. So we have consistent monitoring data um, in over recent history. And the third is to assess disparities in public water arsenic exposure across the US uh, by these major subgroups, by sociodemographic subgroups, so thinking about uh, race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status, by region, major region of the U regions of the U.S., by the size of the population that's served by water systems, and by the source water type. So either um, surface water or, um, I'm sorry, surface water or groundwater. We hypothesized that we would see larger declines for water systems which served larger populations because for these water systems, the kind of cost uh, per person is, is lower and um, there's some uh, financial feasibility concerns for or difficulties for very small water systems. And that we would see large declines in the Southwestern US where we know that groundwater arsenic um, is high. Our methods for this, these projects so we combined two EPA databases. The first is SIDWIS, the Safe Drinking Water Information System, which contains descriptive information for all public water systems in the US, including the counties that are served by those systems and the number of people that are served by those systems. And we merged this in with EPA's third six year review of contaminant occurrence data for arsenic. This data is from 2006 through 2011. And this is um, voluntary, voluntarily sent in data. It's those compliance monitoring records that I talked about earlier that are collected by states and tribal agencies and compiled every six years. So these compliance monitoring records represent 95% uh, of all public water systems and 92% of the total population that's served by those water systems. So it's quite comprehensive for arsenic. Uh, a small note about geographic scale before I continue. So in the US, we don't have distribution boundaries for our water systems um, across all states. Parts of California, uh, the Department of Health for California is working on expanding this to cover the entire state. And um, Eastern Texas also has uh, water system distribution boundaries. But in general, these are not available elsewhere. Uh, Data that we have available from EPA includes county served, which is very reliably reported for uh, almost all water systems, except for tribal water systems, which tend to instead report the city served or the name of the town that's served. This city served variable is only reported for about half of all community water systems, so that's challenging. And although we have administrative zip code, this is not useful for determining uh, the population um, to which water is actually distributed. So um, one thing that uh, Maya Spar, who's a PhD student in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, um, has proposed to begin working on this next year, which is really exciting, is, and she's done this work before with NCI, um, with a different database, uh, is to use the water system name and city served when available to assign census blocks, uh, drinking water arsenic concentrations, for participants in well-established epidemiological cohorts. So this is a problem that we think we can um, best solve first at a small scale by working with uh, individual counties um, that participants from epi cohorts uh, reside within. So this is um, quite exciting. 
Okay, so back to cleaning our six year review arsenic database. We had about 300,000 individual arsenic monitoring records that were reported from 54,000 unique public water systems across the US. We restricted to community water systems. So we excluded other types of public water systems like campgrounds. Um, and we excluded those that were inactive and those that um, reported serving a population size of zero. In the end, we had uh, over 36,000 community water systems serving 2,740 counties in the US. And we averaged our water arsenic concentrations to these two time periods, 2006 through 2008 and 2009 through 2011. For each individual record that went into these averages, we took values below the detection limit and replaced those values by the limit of detection divided by the square root of two for consistency. The reason why we average these water arsenic concentrations to these three year periods is because of the challenges with the compliance monitoring periods that I introduced um, earlier in kind of the background section. So there's differential uh, compliance monitoring requirements by the source water type and by uh, whether or not you've previously exceeded the MCL. So groundwater systems without a recent MCL exceedance are only required to monitor once every three years, but surface water systems are required to monitor every, um, every year. Uh, it's also true that these two time periods separate nicely uh, during versus after the initial compliance monitoring period for the final arsenic rule. So this tells us something about how water systems uh, might have uh, changed arsenic concentrations over time. We also accounted for reported uh, treatment of samples. So when water systems reported both treated and raw samples and the treated averages were less than the raw averages, we kept treated sample averages only, assuming that that is what was distributed to the population. And for our county level averages, we weighed these averages uh, by the population size that was served by each community water system that contributed to that county. And we reported county level values as missing when the total population served by community water systems within a given county, or I'm sorry, within our database was less than 50% of what the total county population that we know is reliant on public drinking water. And this is just to ensure that we're not um, relying on one small or a few small water systems to generate uh, a county level average. Okay. In our statistical analysis, so for our second objective, which was to evaluate trends in water arsenic concentrations over time, we compared the distribution of community water system arsenic across these two time periods. Uh, we compared means, we compared the number and percent of MCL exceedances, and we looked at quantiles of arsenic um, and how those quantile values changed over time uh, via quantile regression. Our third objective was to assess disparities or inequalities in exposure. So we repeated these analyses um, stratified by these four major subgroups, um, which I previously listed. And those are shown here uh, graphically. So here's how we decided to categorize region based on states that we thought would have uh, similar um, groundwater arsenic concentrations. And these sociodemographic county clusters, we borrowed from um, this group of researchers, Wallace et al. Uh, this is categorizing counties based on the overall racial, ethnic, sociodemographic, socioeconomic uh, makeup of the county so that you can make direct comparisons across counties within a, uh, a given group. Uh, the next uh, kind of analytical choice we made was to categorize each water system or county into an MCL compliance category. And here I've shown you four examples, two water systems and two different counties. And depending on the average concentration for that water system or county in the first versus the second compliance period, we assigned that system or county a compliance category. So when we use the 10 microgram per liter uh, compliance uh, cut point, this first water system in California had a value above 10 micrograms per liter in the first period, but below in the second. So this water system gets this high, low category designation. 
And similarly, you can see these examples for um, a county that was low, low, and a water system in California that was above 10 micrograms per liter in both cut points, or both time points. And so this is a high, high water system. And we did this so that we could identify characteristics of counties and community water systems that were in this high, high group, this really problematic group that still didn't reduce water arsenic below the new regulatory standard. We also did this at five and one micrograms per liter, uh, because as Mindy said, uh, five micrograms per liter is the MCL for New Hampshire and New Jersey, and it's also the MCL for Denmark. And one microgram per liter is the MCL for the Netherlands, and it's also uh, close to EPA's goal of zero micrograms per liter, um, yet feasible. Okay, so our results for arsenic. First, I'm just showing you a table with some data coverage um, numbers here. So for the community water systems, we had over 36,000 community water systems, and that's about 98% of the community water systems um, that we know uh, exist in the US. Uh, across these two time periods, um, in the first time period, we had 995 water systems. Uh, exceed the MCL, and in the second time period, we had uh, 738 water systems exceed the MCL. For our counties, we had 2,740 counties, or 87% of all counties in the U.S. and county equivalents, and we had 2,262 counties which uh, had adequate data during both time periods. So these are the counties that we can evaluate the compliance categories for. Here's our main map. Um, so this work is coming out in um, EHP this Wednesday. Here's our map of county level community water system arsenic concentrations from 2006 through 2011. This is also available in an interactive map um, at this link here, columbiaarsenicmap.com. And you can see that um, here I have uh, colored in each county by uh, the concentration in, in these categories here. So less than or equal to one, quite low, uh, greater than one to five, greater than five to 10, and in this darker, darkest red color, uh, greater than 10 micrograms per liter or exceeding the MCL. You can already tell from this map that there are whole states which did not report data to EPA's six-year review. So that includes Colorado, uh, it includes Delaware, um, some of these states down here, Georgia, and in this very light green, which also looks uh, like it's white on this map, these are counties with inadequate data. These are counties where we did have uh, community water systems report arsenic averages, but we didn't have 50% of the public water population represented by those water systems. So we felt that the, uh, those were not adequate. The highest public water arsenic concentrations are clearly here in the Southwestern Midwest, uh, Southwestern US, and in some parts of the Midwest, um, and um, a little bit up here in New England, uh, but certainly not as much as the uh, central Midwest here. The mean water arsenic concentrations uh, were 1.89 in this first time period, and they declined by about 0.2 micrograms per liter, or about 10% over this time period. The percentage of samples exceeding the MCL also declined from 3.2 to 2.3% across this time period. But at baseline, uh, we saw some substantial differences by region. So these plots here, I'll orient you to now. These are called rain cloud plots. And I'm showing you the distribution of average community water system arsenic concentrations uh, stratified by what will be eight different regions. Here I'm showing you the four regions with the lowest water arsenic concentrations at baseline. That's the Southeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Central Midwest, and the Eastern Midwest. In each of these panels, uh, I'm showing you the distribution in three different ways. This top bump here is a density plot. So you can see where the majority of the points lie on this um, concentration scale here, which runs from 0.2 to 54. Each individual dot represents a community water system, and there's a box plot here at the bottom, so you can see the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. The overall average for each region is here in a, in a red dot as well, and I've indicated the 10 microgram per liter maximum contaminant level here in this red dashed line. So relatively few water systems in these regions are exceeding the MCL at baseline. 
These four regions, New England, the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, Hawaii, and the Southwest uh, had higher average arsenic concentrations at baseline. And in the Southwest, you can see that the shape of the distribution here is quite unique. It's clearly bimodal. There is a proportion of substantial proportion of water systems with very low water arsenic, and then also a substantial proportion of water systems with arsenic um, out here in the tail, and a large number of systems that are exceeding the MCL. Next, I'm gonna move on to showing you differences over time um, from our quantile regression results. So uh, quantile regression uh, allows you to evaluate, in this case, the changes in water arsenic that occurred at other quantiles of the distribution instead of just looking at the mean change. And this is particularly relevant for this problem because the final arsenic rule is a rule that we anticipated would impact the most highly exposed communities or the water systems that at baseline had the highest water arsenic concentrations. So on the y-axis here, I'm illustrating the change in water arsenic concentration across these two time periods. And on the x-axis here, I'm showing you that change at a given quantile. This first panel here shows all community water systems. And you can see that the change uh, over time was greater at higher quantiles uh, of water arsenic concentrations. These three regions, the Southeast, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Central Midwest, had the smallest changes in water arsenic exposure over time. And these four regions, the Eastern Midwest, New England, the Pacific Northwest, and the Southwest, had the greatest changes in water arsenic exposure over time. You can see that in particular um, for the Eastern Midwest, the changes uh, out here at the 97th, 98th, 99th percentile uh, were quite large and um, much larger than the change, than the mean change that occurred. And so these plots are really highlighting that the final arsenic rule, this change in the regulatory standard, uh, was an intervention that really impacted these high arsenic exposure water systems and highly exposed populations. And we did, um, the reason, we also evaluated whether or not um, adjustment for source water type or the size of the population served changed these results and um, they really had no impact at all, actually. Here I've just listed um, the change at the 99th percentile that occurred. So you can see that the change ranged from uh, negligible in the Southeast to 8.4 micrograms per liter in the Eastern Midwest. Okay. Uh, so this map here, I'm showing you, uh, I've mapped those compliance categories using a 10 microgram per liter cut point. So the current arsenic MCL. The lightest color in light green here shows counties where the average water arsenic concentration was below 10 micrograms per liter uh, during both time points. And that is by far the most common scenario. Most counties fall into this category. In this uh, light lovely blue, this electric blue color, we have counties that are in the high low compliance category. And these are counties that successfully uh, implemented uh, the new regulatory standard. So they were above 10 micrograms per liter. And when this became enforceable, they were successful in reducing water arsenic concentrations in accordance with that new standard. So these are um, success story counties. Counties in the darkest blue, uh, like out here in Nevada, these are counties that were above 10 micrograms per liter in both time points, um, which is not what we would like to see. Okay, so the mean change in arsenic concentrations by each of these categories, there was essentially no change in the low, low category. And in the, the successful success story counties, the high, low counties, uh, on average reduced their water arsenic by 12.8 micrograms per liter, which is quite substantial and exciting. And counties in this high, high category um, reduced water arsenic only by about one microgram per liter. Uh, clearly also inadequate for these counties to come on average in compliance with the, the new MCL. Okay, so what are the characteristics of these counties that are in this high, high category um, that remain uh, non-compliant with the new MCL? So these uh, water systems that were in this, this category uh, were more likely served by groundwater. Uh, here I'm showing you the uh, stats for the community water systems in those categories. And then I've also put a column here for the overall, among all uh, community water systems, um, what those stats are so that you can make a little comparison yourself. So clearly these water systems were more likely served by groundwater. 
they served smaller populations. They were more likely to be located in the Southwest. They were uh, much more likely to serve uh, semi-urban Hispanic counties. Uh, this is from those sociodemographic county cluster uh, categorizations. And they were more likely to uh, be tribal water systems. For these successful water systems that went from high to low water arsenic, these were also more likely to be served by groundwater. They also served smaller populations. They were also more likely to be in the Southwest, um, but they were certainly also more likely to be in the Eastern Midwest. Um, because as you saw in the Quantau regression plots, the Eastern Midwest um, was quite successful in implementing this arsenic rule. Um, and so I've said before that EPA's goal for goal maximum contaminant level for arsenic is zero. And ideally we have a large margin of safety in our public health regulations. Um, and so the states of New Jersey and New Hampshire and Denmark have already passed uh, an MCL of five micrograms per liter. If we apply that cut point to our map, this is what our counties look like now. So now you can see we have a much larger number of counties that are falling into um, one of these high categories. Uh, they tend to be uh, still in parts of the Midwest and in the Southwestern US. And if we then take this one step for further and we apply the one micro microgram per liter cut point, which is close to EPA's goal of zero, it's analytically feasible, and it's the Netherlands MCL, uh, we get this map. Uh, and here you can see that um, almost half of the country now would be out of compliance um, during both time periods if we were to um, establish a one microgram per liter MCL. And in particular, um, systems in the southwestern U.S. would have a very difficult time um, meeting that regulatory standard. And now I'm going to uh, transition into talking about an additional uh, vulnerable population in the southwestern U.S., um, and that's uh, incarcerated populations um, who are in uh, jails and prisons and correctional facilities that have their own public water systems. Okay, so... Um, you probably all know that uh, mass incarceration is a public health crisis in the US. Uh, at any given point, there are about 2 million people who are incarcerated and one in three black men will be incarcerated in their lifetime. These populations experience many health disparities, including elevated prevalence of both infectious and chronic diseases and premature mortality rates. Um, and during the course of this project, I happened to notice that there are public water systems that exclusively serve correctional facilities. So here I've just put a, a screenshot here for you, just four systems that all happen to be in California. And um, you can see the names of these systems are things like Kern Valley State Prison, California Correctional Center, Central California Women's Facility. Um, so this is a unique opportunity to study the potential for environmental and racial injustice in incarcerated populations. And I'd like to explicitly make the point that um, incarcerated populations don't have access to alternative drinking water sources or even point of use treatment devices in the event of compromised drinking water quality. And uh, prior to this work, there was um, nothing in the uh, published peer review literature that was systematically evaluating drinking water quality uh, for these communities. So for this um, paper, this, this study, um, our methods were um, utilizing this public water arsenic database that I've already um, uh, introduced. And we compared the six year average water arsenic concentrations in correctional facility community water systems versus all other community water systems. And we restricted this analysis to the southwestern U.S. because, uh, as we, we now know, um, this is also where public water arsenic concentrations um, are quite high. And we identified correctional facilities uh, using uh, this keyword search. So we, we searched for these words and then um, verified with the system name that these were, in fact, um, appropriate. Here are our results for all other community water systems in the southwestern U.S. So these are not correctional facilities. Um, these served about 78 million people and we had over 8,000 systems. Um, there's a clear bimodal distribution, uh, which we saw earlier in the same rain cloud plot, where we have a lot of systems with very low arsenic and a lot of systems with uh, low moderate arsenic out here um, at and above two micrograms per liter. The average for these systems was 3.1 micrograms per liter, and 5.8% of them exceeded the MCL. 
For our correctional facilities, we had uh, 23 water systems that exclusively served correctional facilities in this area that served over 90,000 people. Um, this distribution is not bimodal. It's relatively uniform and more normally distributed. And you can also see differences in these distributions by comparing the box plots up here uh, versus down here. So the mean water arsenic concentration for these uh, correctional facilities was 6.4, twice as high as the average for all these other water systems in the area. And six or about a quarter of them um, exceeded the MCL. We also evaluated the odds ratios of average arsenic exceeding the 10 microgram per liter for correctional facilities versus all other community water systems, which we treated as the reference. Um, we looked at crude models, we looked at models adjusting for a source water type and the size of the population served. Um, and we found that um, there was significantly higher odds of exceeding the MCL for these correctional facilities. And these results were robust even when um, using a five microgram per liter cut point and even when using three-year arsenic averages instead of uh, six-year averages. So anyway, we slice the data. Um, this is a major inequality um, for populations who are incarcerated in the Southwest. So now I'm gonna uh, briefly cover our recent uranium work, um, most of which has been done by Filippo Rivali, who's an undergraduate uh, at Columbia University and who is um, a fantastic emerging scholar. So our objectives for uranium were identical to the ones we had for arsenic, except that we can't yet evaluate these trends in exposure over time. And that's because we didn't have an MCL for uranium prior to 2003. Other than that though, this is the same um, analysis. We also had to combine data for uranium because of its um, unique compliance monitoring uh, periods. We had to combine data from the second six-year review by EPA, which starts in 2000, with the third uh, six-year review, which goes through 2011. In this case, for uranium, we only had about 14,000 community water systems serving 1,680 counties. And in this case, we made the decision to average these exposure estimates to this entire time period, 2000 through 2011. We've been playing with this a bit. We have other um, averaging periods, but given the data we have right now, I think this is our best current approach. Uh, this time period combines all three of those uh, compliance cycle periods that I introduced earlier. The grandfathered period, the initial compliance monitoring period, and the first compliance cycle. And this also helps us deal with um, the differential compliance monitoring missingness by source water type and uranium concentration. Um, because for uranium, um, we know that the first compliance cycle, which runs from 2008 through 2016, means that we have some water systems that are gonna have one record for this entire time period. Um, and we're gonna have to wait until 2023 until we get a new data release with more recent years. So I'm really looking forward to that, but in the meantime, I wanna keep working with what we have, knowing that it is imperfect and um, looking forward to uh, updating it. Okay, so our results for uranium. Uh, so here's our total number of water systems, only about 14,000, uh, but we still had 388 or 2.6% that exceeded the uranium MCL. Counties, we only had 1,680, but we still had 29 counties that ex on average at the county level um, exceeded the uranium MCL. So here's what our uh, county level map looks like for uranium. You'll notice there's a lot of missing data and even more uh, inadequate data. These are counties where we have some uranium monitoring records available, but not enough to create a robust or valid exposure estimate for the public water reliant population. The dark purple areas here are where the counties on average are exceeding the MCL. There's a large number of them here um, in the central Midwest. There's a few in the Southwest and there are some up here in the Pacific Northwest. On average, the uh, Average uranium concentration for these community water systems for this entire time period was 9.93 micrograms per liter and 2.6% um, exceeded the MCL. Uranium concentrations were also differential by region, of course. Um, so Alaska, Hawaii, the Eastern Midwest, the Southeast and the Mid-Atlantic had relatively low concentrations on average of uranium in community water systems. 
And now these four regions are our highest free radium, New England, the Southwest, the Pacific Northwest, and the Central Midwest. And it's worth noting that the Pacific Northwest and the Central Midwest averages were quite high, 34 um, for both of these. Uh, but of course, these are, you know, really skewed distributions. And you can see that for both of these, the 75th percentile is well below the MCL. But the averages um, are still quite high because we have a number of systems out here with very high uranium concentrations. And I have evaluated these individual records, and I don't think these are flukes, just as a note. Okay, so what are the characteristics of these non-compliant community water systems for uranium? And I say non-compliant here in quotations because, of course, this includes the period preceding the official uranium MCL enactment. Um, these community water systems were more likely in the central Midwest, in the Southwest, served by groundwater, serving smaller populations, and serving semi-urban Hispanic communities. And this all looks very familiar to what we saw um, with our arsenic maps. So major conclusions from um, this body of work. So limitations, um, of course, data quality with the six year review database um, is something that I'm really looking forward to hopefully addressing in this upcoming year. 2021 is my year, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna uh, pull the individual state level data from Colorado and Georgia and Delaware. Um, which is available and incorporate it um, hopefully into these exposure estimates in a way that is uh, valid and hopefully similar to what um, EPA has done. For uranium, <clears throat> uh, really can't wait until 2023 so we can get that updated data and have um, a more valid exposure estimate. And of course we are, like I said earlier, having some um, geographic resolution issues. I feel we're currently limited to the county. Um, but my Spar has an amazing plan to uh, begin doing this on a small scale with individual epidemiological cohorts, which I think can help us pave the way and figure out how to do this really well. So we found that public water arsenic did decrease over time, um, especially in New England and especially in the Eastern Midwest, what I'm calling the Eastern Midwest, um, but remains very high in this Central Midwest and the Northern Great Plains and in the Southwestern US. We found uh, larger declines in exposure for smaller water systems com compared, uh, compared to larger water systems and even higher declines in exposure at higher quantiles of the distribution, telling us that this intervention is really impacting um, the water systems with the highest arsenic and the communities that are most highly exposed. But of course, um, these decreases weren't uniform and we have major environmental injustice uh, concerns and concerns for these subgroups, which we know remain vulnerable to high arsenic um, from public drinking water systems. So these are the semi-urban Hispanic communities, these small water systems that are reliant on groundwater, the Southwestern US, uh, and even rural American Indian counties, although we have um, some limited data um, for these types of systems. And of course, persons incarcerated in the Southwest, um, and we're now expanding um, this line of work to look at other regulated contaminants as well. So the conclusion here is that um, sustained and additional technical and financial assistance and regulatory enforcement is really needed, um, especially so that these smaller water systems, these water systems that are not meeting the MCL um, can, can meet the MCL, <laughs> can reduce water arsenic as much as possible. Okay. Um, I hinted to this earlier, but um, these are characteristics of community water systems um, that have either high arsenic or high uranium um, exceeding the MCL. These are shared amongst both these groups of counties uh, serving semi-urban Hispanic communities. So uh, we definitely need to figure out what's going on there. Um, the Southwest and smaller populations. Um, so this work also highlights, I think, the success of a single public health regulation um, in reducing water arsenic exposure for some communities by a lot, 50 to 10 micrograms per liter. Um, but I'd also like to highlight that um, we have more work to do to get us to uh, what is a more health protective regulatory standard for everybody. And I'd like to highlight that I think um, this work is convincing me that uranium is an underappreciated contaminant in public water systems. If I just look at, you know, amongst the data that we currently have for uranium, not even considering this next data release that's coming in two years, um, we still have, you know, almost 2.6%. We have 2.6% of community water systems that are exceeding that MCL. 
Um, we are develop we have developed an online interactive map, but we're majorly improving this um, because we're working on exposure estimates. We have them now for all of the regulated metals in public water systems, and we're expanding um, this winter to the organic contaminants as well. So we're building an R Shiny dashboard um, for better data dissemination and download and data exploration. And I just want to finish by highlighting um, some more of Maya's work. So Maya has um, taken these exposure estimates that we derived and she's evaluating the association between the um, probability of private well arsenic exceeding 10 micrograms per liter um, and the association between these private wells with our public water systems. And um, two just interesting tidbits that Maya has found in her work, which I think are really interesting areas for further exploration, um, especially with our Superfund group, um, here are her, are her linear associations um, between private wells and public water systems stratified by region and then stratified by our sociodemographic clusters. And I've highlighted here the central Midwest and rural American Indian communities. And what you can see is that these lines actually stop here at about 0.3, probability of 0.3, and here about 0.2. And what we think might be happening, given what we know about public water arsenic um, and private well arsenic in um, a lot of these communities where we, we have the, the well data, we think maybe the estimates for the private well arsenic are actually underestimating um, the private well arsenic in those areas, um, simply because maybe the number of samples there um, is too sparse. So I think this is a really interesting area um, that um, some folks in our Superfund program um, are thinking um, really closely about. So um, great work by Maya. She submitted this paper this fall. So fingers crossed that uh, this is uh, successful. Uh, and with that, I just have an acknowledgement slide. I want to thank the Superfund program, um, Anna, of course, um, our, you know, our, our leader, uh, Maya and Filippo for their fantastic work on all of this, um, and all of our collaborators and colleagues on these projects. Um, we have some time for questions. A wonderful, Annie, wonderful presentation. Very comprehensive. So, and I think lots of questions, lots of comments. Oh boy. Chat. Oh yeah, boy. You want to, to look at them later. You know, I don't think you'll be, we'll be able to cover all the comments in the chat because there are lots of ideas and comments. I think there was some comment early on about the limits of detection and the variability in the data and, and the fact that maybe categorizing the, in, in this two low versus high when you have variability and, and maybe the samples might be switching a category from low to high, uh, just you know a little bit by ra at random because of that variability in the data. So those were, and, and the limits of detection, those were some comments that were written that maybe you want to discuss. Sure. So the limits of detection were, are totally up to the labs that the water systems are sending their samples to. So we don't have any control over that. Um, we did our best with the limits of detection. We kind of sliced and diced the data a few different ways. Um, from my perspective in public health, anything under one microgram per liter is excellent, um, given where we are right now, especially with the Southwestern US and the Central Midwest. Um, but we tried um, a few kind of standard approaches for dealing with data below the LOD. Um, and we had a lot of, of systems um, below the LOD, that is for sure. Anna, what was the second question? about the variability in the data that, you know, by, by, you are dichotomizing in groups, low yeah. versus high. Sure, but yeah, yeah, we definitely did that. Um, that's a choice we made, but we also have um, the mean uh, concentrations and the quantile concentrations for each of these subgroups. Um, so I think what we've tried to do is make um, the best use of uh, the data in, in, in both formats as a continuous variable and, and then again, trying to categorize it so that we have um, some category that we can evaluate as kind of a worst case scenario and um, you know, the successful intervention scenario. But yes, absolutely. Um, you, so, you saw that the changes over time uh, in some of those groups, like the low high group was um, you know, not very informative, so. So you also got a lot of resources about uranium. People are oh, giving great. you uh, websites and a lot of information about uranium. Different people are uh, giving you uh, access to those. So that would be great. Thank ben, you. Ben had a question about uh, a community water, uh, the correctional water facilities, and if there is a difference between public and private prison systems. 
Great question, Ben. Uh, that's not something that I have evaluated yet. So uh, I, do, you, do you have a suggestion? I, I think they're different. Okay. I'm not, I mean, I have a, my, the, my experience is N equals two, but certainly, <laughs> so I, I can't claim extensive experience or anything, but, but certainly a lot of um, the private prisons have come at a different, they're, they're mo more modern which is one particular difference, but they also are very different kinds of communities uh -huh. um, and, and certainly have different kinds of connections to, to those public water supplies or, or not public water supplies in many cases. Um, I don't know how much information is available about each prison system, but, but it certainly seems like it might be uh, an interesting avenue to look at given how much pressure that there has been to privatize the prison system and thinking about whether that is helping or not. I, I partly say this part because when we were looking at the um, family detention centers in Texas, what we found is that the private systems, which those are, wouldn't even allow us to test the water. So the only way we were actually able to test the water is going in as with the with the law teams and actually claiming we needed a drink of water and then taking it with it. Wow. Um, and there so, was another question related kind of also like if are the people in the employees of the prisons, do they have access to different water systems or different maybe treated water? So um, what I know from individual case reports and also from um, legal suits that have been brought by incarcerated people and previously incarcerated people, um, so these are all um, like anecdotes, is that um, there are some staff members who will bring their own drinking water from home or who will bring bottled water in. Um, but yes, they would also have access to the same drinking water that the um, incarcerated folks would have, um, just with additional options available to them, you know, and, and those folks also go home at some point, right? They go home to their uh, other public water systems that they drink from. Um, most of us drink from a variety of public water systems. When, when it's not COVID, we drink at work, we drink at home, we drink at school, places of worship, etc. That's not the case with um, incarcerated folks. But Ben, um, that's a great question. And that's something we could um, chat more about later, see if there's something um, something else we can do. Yeah. There is a question about outreach to students and their communities to make sure that the students are also engaged and that often these communities have uh, outdated resources uh, so I don't know if you want to comment about your work with some uh, students and outreach with uh, high school students. Ah, uh, yeah, in the Dakotas, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. kind of related to that comment. Yeah, um, so we've, Anna and I have been um, working, and, and Ben too, and I think I saw Marsha logged off, um, with, um, we work with um, a, a community-based organization in a tribal community in um, the Northern Plains. And um, we've gotten to mentor a couple of fantastic high school students over the past couple of years um, on a variety of projects. Um, some of them uh, just high school science fair projects that were exceptional. Um, uh, one young woman won uh, a state science fair award for her project. Um, and even um, we've gotten to engage um, a really excellent high school student on a uh, project that was uh, developed and um, created by uh, this community-based organization. So we've had great success um, and a really great time um, mentoring and, and working with, with those students. Um, I, I really look forward to doing it again when we can all be back in person. Um, but it's, yeah, we've, we've had great success working across all, all levels, you know? And, and you have a more comments and, and questions. I don't know if we have any time to take a few others, but one is about from uh, Peter uh, Napet. He's asking about different meth treatment methods and if there could be a for arsenic mm -hmm. and if there could be a legacy effect in the distribution pipes, for example, arsenic sorbed to iron oxides that are gradually released in the distribution pipes 
And I don't know if you have an answer to that question, but I was wondering if Steve or, or Ben would answer that question. Yeah, I don't have an answer to, to that. That sounds important and relevant. So please, if someone knows about the sorbing to the iron oxides, I would love to hear about it. Well, like, Anna, one thing I noticed is that um, your, your performance assessment of at the county level of, of, of counties in Texas lined up perfectly with the, with, the, with the way the aquifers are oriented from northeast to southwest. Uh -huh. So the Carrizo, I, I live just above the Carrizo Wilcox aquifer in Brazos County. And, and we, um, we started out, according to your map, we started out performing pretty well and we finished performing pretty well. If you go southeast to the next outcropping aquifer or uh, the, 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 what is it, the Gulf Coast aquifer, that, that one was doing pretty poorly. And I noticed that they didn't, they didn't really improve over time. And so that, that led me to think, hey, hey what, I, are they actually doing something? Are, are they doing some reverse osmosis? Are they, you know, like, what are they trying to do? And, and then, and then that, that other, the other thought I had about the legacy effect. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So to my knowledge, I have not been able to find information from EPA on the exact type of treatment technique that's being used by each water system. It's possible that that might exist, um, but I have not yet found it myself. Um, I know there are a variety of um, methods that folks use from various treatment systems to just switching or even mixing source water. I know mixing source water, um, uh, certainly in the, the Northern Plains, um, definitely happens. But Ben, do you have a, an idea? Um, so my, my biggest, I would say comment on that would be that uh, the treatment probably also is correlated to size of system quite a bit um, because there's so many exemptions for small scale systems and in general most of the smaller systems use increasingly simple technologies we'll call it so that you you probably find a correlation of system size and how well they work <laughs> in terms of relationships. Um, but, but in general, most of them are gonna work on some absorption medium and that's designed to, to hopefully remove these things. They don't all work great though for any of these conditions, right? Um, well, Peter, was your, was your question about the distribution system or the treatment system? Um, main, both, but main, mainly about mainly about what specific treatment methods they're using, assuming assuming they're they're somehow being motivated or penalized for 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 getting that arsenic uh, concentration lower. I, th I think Andy said something about that. But I I I'm, I just, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's motivating them. Like, are they being are they being fined for not 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 going from eleven to nine micrograms per liter? Um, sometimes it seems a little arbitrary to me, these, you know, oh, it's 11, no, it's nine, okay, you're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. It is, um, so 10, it, there's like a hard, a hard point of 10, um, and uh, violations can result in fines. So usually my understanding is that um, when EPA becomes aware of a violation, they try to come up with a, a game plan with that water system um, to try, and they're supposed to assist that water system in um, installing a treatment system or, you know, switching or mixing source water. Um, but if there's a game plan put in place and that water system, an agreement, and that water system continues to exceed the MCL, then um, the fines can, can come. How does the state EPA get involved? Does this, does, is it most of it done through the state EPA, whereas the, the federal EPA just kind of wields the stick and the uh, my understanding, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, is that the states report the monitoring records to the federal EPA, who um, is then responsible for the fines, but perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah, this is Alton Sabo. I would say um, that in general, uh, the states have primacy of water, of drinking water regulation. So they get the first crack at it. And then the federal system steps in if the state system is not working. So that's, that's, that's the way it lines up. A quick comment on uh, the question that was asked about the drinking water uh, and distribution pipes and sorption of arsenic contaminants to that. Water Research Foundation put out about a 100 page report, I'd say five to seven years ago on, um, 
they looked at various contaminants uh, being sorbed to drinking water distribution system, iron hydroxide coatings and pipes. I don't have the exact citation for you at my fingertips, but I'm thinking with the, the keywords of Water Research Foundation, you probably ought to be able to find it. And they did a pretty exhaustive study. Thank you, you so much. That was super remember, informative. Do you remember, Zoltan, whether they looked at the variable of whether they used orthophosphate or not? Because I would think that would make a huge difference. I, I would think that would make a huge difference, but in all fairness, I have to be honest, I don't recall if they looked at that. Yeah. So I think this conversation is fascinating. There are lots of comments for you, Annie, to now uh, go and take a look at them. Yes. Let me, uh, I'm so going to put my email in the chat um, and, try yes. and, and try and see these comments and respond if I can. And, and maybe na, na, since we've recorded the session, all the all the comments are going to be there. And we have, I believe, email addresses or contact information for the people who participated. So Annie, you can also follow up uh, with people uh, individually. So thank you so much. I don't know if we want to, want to take also a screen uh, shot with <laughs> Annie. So for that, I would say if you can and, and, <laughs> and clap and people, if you can put your cameras on so that we can have a nice uh, screenshot full of people uh, here. Uh, oh, hi, Daniel. Hey. If I remember how to do this now. Ah, here it is. Very good. Everybody smile. Thank you so much for joining. Wonderful presentations. Thank you and have a wonderful evening, everybody. A great discussion. We'll follow up in Thank 2021. You. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.